The Tom Woods Show, episode 789. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you missed the Contra Cruise, a week of hilarity and tremendous fun at sea with Bob Murphy and me, well, check out the highlight video and just maybe a link to future cruises. Check it out at ContraCruise.com. If you're a homeschooling parent and you're tired of running yourself ragged, then check out the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. And check it out through my special link where you get three free bonuses totaling $160. My special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. For today's episode, I am sharing with you an appearance I had on the Jason Stapleton program, which I have talked to you about in the past. Jason's been a guest on this show. Jason had me on to elaborate on a blog post and an email that I sent out about a week and a half ago now on trying to reason with the left. And I was arguing that it's pointless most of the time. Now, I'm somebody who has made converts from the left. I wrote a book with a guy on the left, my book on war with Murray Polner. So it's not like I'm saying there's absolutely no hope whatsoever. But I'm talking about in general, there's a reason that we have, I personally think we have more trouble making inroads with the left. There's a reason that Fox News will at least invite some of our people on, much as they are terrible, despicable uh, people, the Fox News folks, a lot of them. They'll have some of our people on. MSNBC doesn't have some of our people on, even if we are good on war and civil liberties. When was the last time they invited, well, I guess they have invited Justin Raimondo, but not a whole lot. Okay, you see what I mean? So anyway, so I talked about that in my email, and Jason took some exception to what I was saying, and so we had a little bit of a discussion hashing this all out. One of the topics that's raised, by the way, I will note, is the prospect of my running for the Libertarian Party nomination, which, by the way, is not going to happen, and you will discover why in this episode. You can check out Jason's program at jasonstapleton.com. I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 789, and here we go. Please welcome Tom Woods to the show. Tom, thanks for being here. Always glad to be with you, Jason. All right. Well, let's, let me give a little context to this first. So that we've got something to discuss and people who may not have read uh, your piece uh, can, can get some context. So it says at the top, it says, uh, I'll just start from the beginning. It says, I see people telling the left these days, see, this is why.
and I'm saying this as somebody who has been, you can find many favorable things I've said about Gary Johnson before this year. I have been kind. I mean, I haven't thought he was particularly, you know, like the smartest guy I ever met, but he's not, he doesn't have to be to be a good politician. But this year, I just felt like, the Gary Johnson of 2016 seems like the Gary Johnson of 2008. It doesn't seem like eight years of passionate learning mm-hmm. have taken place or eight years of debate training or speaking training or I don't know what. He gets passionate about the most bizarre things, like he's going to yell at a reporter for using the term illegal immigrant or something. <laughs> that yes. makes him passionate. That's not Normal people aren't that passionate about that sort of thing. So I think his main problem was, frankly, he was a bore. He didn't. I mean, there was no youth movement behind him that said, I'm going to drop everything. And in this historic election, I'm going to campaign for him. He was a bore. And then he urged his supporters to support a guy who was worse than a bore. I mean, just an outright traitor to the cause, which was Bill Weld. I mean, Bill Weld is actually on TV saying Hillary Clinton will give us a good businesslike, reliable uh, governance. And, well, what do you think about your own nominee on your own ticket, Bill Weld? And, and he said, you know, I'm, I think Gary Johnson would be a good commander in chief. So like, he can – and then he says, despite Aleppo. So he yeah, brings he focuses up the, on the embarrassing part. Yeah. yeah. Who does that? Who does that? You think Tim Kaine would have said, well, despite the fact that she stumbled into that car on national television, I think she's in robust hell. Of course you wouldn't say that. The the guy was a disaster. And plus the way they pitched themselves was we're this, you know, we're a centrist party. We're a centrist party. We're common sense. We're just taking the good ideas from both sides. And that, I'm sorry, that doesn't, that doesn't do it. Now, there will be people who will say, well, Woods, let me tell you something. My personal friends told me they very much resonated with what uh, or what what Weld and Johnson said about that really resonated with them and you can't just appeal to libertarian ideologues you know there are people who are practical people yep you know what when push came to shove how many of those friends of yours voted for Johnson Weld answer zero they all voted for Hillary so yeah they they appeal to the sensible people who watch MSNBC and CNN but not one of those people is going to vote for them so there was no enthusiasm there at all are you worried at all? Because this is something that it, that's that I've spoken about quite a bit. I am worried that this is going to become, even though, uh, even though Gary Johnson performed so poorly, and I think you've you've done a good job of laying out some of the reasons why. I think the fact that he walks away with three percent, which is the most that any candidate has has ever gotten, uh, what fe- what I fear is that the Libertarian Party in general is going to see this as as a template moving forward. If we go and we find these kind of centrist candidates and maybe we just find one who's a little more articulate, uh, who's a little less crazy. And, and then if we can just pick this, this kind of centrist candidate and that, 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 that guy will be able to, uh, will be able to move the ball forward even, even closer to that 5% than we have right now. And, and what I really want is, I, you know, I don't, I don't want some, I, I don't want a guy who's going to talk about burning the government down. I, I think that that is counterproductive to trying to preach this this message, and, and with this we can kind of transition into that bit of bit of the uh, interview. But I do think that it's important that you have someone who is truly principled, and you've got a team of people who are extremely articulate and well versed in libertarian principle that can share those and aren't running into stumbling blocks every time they show up on an inter- at an interview. Well, I well okay. So in other words, I mean, I agree with that, that I would like to see that. I don't want to see what what you're saying that the Libertarian Party is likely to conclude from this. I don't want to see that happen. I would like to see and, – and by the way, the two choices are not boring, 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 we're the centrist party on the one hand and immediately abolish everything on the other. 99.999% of the public is not ready for that. You have to explain to, it to them where they are. I have no problem with that. That's why Harry, that's why Harry Brown was so good. He was a absolute rock solid libertarian, but he had these aphorisms and these one liners that just made you stop in your tracks and think. Mm-hmm. Now that comes along only once in a great while. So I don't want to say that everybody has to be like Harry Brown, but you only have one libertarian nominee. Surely we've got one person who's effective at this. And I'll say, here's what I'm afraid will happen in 2020. Uh, I'm without mentioning names. What I'm afraid will happen in 2020 is that we'll be faced with a choice of whoever the Gary Johnson of the day is, 
And on the other hand, it'll be a couple of egomaniacal celebritarians mm -hmm. who are latching on to the LP because it's better than getting a job. And I, you know, there are some smart people we could potentially think about, but I'm, I'm afraid it's a case of the worst gets on top. And then they'll say to me, well, hey, Woods, you got your radical libertarian. Why aren't you happy? Right. That's not enough. I, I want I want people who seem like decent people and, and um, people I can get behind. Well, some people would say that 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 person that you've just described yourself, Tom. What, what do you what do you say to those people? No, well, first of all, <laughs> oh, yeah, well, hang on now, Tom, because I, I that is my gut reaction when people ask when people say those same things to me. But you just said, hey, I'm hoping that we have this person and, and that he meets these criteria. And certainly, you cannot deny that you are most certainly a person that fits that bill, and you would be incredible. At, at articulating that message. Um, if, if the answer is a flat no, no discussion, you know, why? Why would you say no to that? First of all, the, the, responsi the most important responsibility I have in this world is to my five girls. And the, the liberty movement, everything else in my life comes second. And that would be a grueling and unforgiving series of who knows how many months. And it would be miserable. Uh, and it would be – I would be neglecting them and it would be just wrong. It would be wrong and irresponsible for me to do. Now, if you're going to say, Woods, as a hobby when you're in your 50s, would you consider it? Uh, again, probably not because I, I just – I have too many skeletons and not – I haven't had any affairs, so it's not that. But the skeletons are out in plain view. They're not even in a closet. They're out in plain view. Just read some of my books. You can take one sentence here, one sentence there, or one thing I said in the heat of the moment on my podcast or whatever – and they'll paint me out to be a, you know, that I want to bring back slavery or whatever the crazy thing is. Yeah. You know, you know how the, this stuff is. And I just, I think that would be all these young people I get telling me you should run. It would be really demoralizing for them because they'd spend all their time saying, "Now wait a minute, what Woods meant in that article in 1998 or whatever." Come on, that's that's not fair to do to anybody. Uh, and secondly, I feel like I've been around for a while at this point. I mean, maybe. Some people have heard of me since the Ron Paul rally for the Republic. Some people all the way back to my politically incorrect guide to American history. But we're talking 8, 10, 12 years here, and people are still looking to the same handful of liberty spokesmen. And I feel like we got to have some young blood out there. It can't just be, well, you know, Woods has been around for a while. Let's, let's go with him. Ron Paul brought in a million, two million people into this movement. And I got to believe there are some strong, articulate spokesmen in there. So let them come forward. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. And then that's it's a fair response to the question. So uh, I'll leave it at that. And, and I want to move in and now talk a little bit about what we do moving forward and address uh, some of the comments you had in your article. So my position has been that this is a golden opportunity for us to take people who now are realizing the incredible amount of power that the executive has. Much of it has been concentrated over many years, although we only, conservatives only tend to look at this over the Obama administration, but you could go back to Bush before that and find where there has been this, this constant consolidation of power into the, into the executive branch. And this was all fine for progressives over the last eight years. And now they're starting to realize that, hey, the guy who now holds the highest office in the land could roll back a lot of policies that Obama put into effect, and he can also do a bunch of stuff himself that would punish us rather than the other guy. And we have now, the tyranny has now turned its head, so to speak. And my position has been, we need to go find these people because they're, they're in emotional state of shock. These are one, is one of the rare times when you're going to find a person and you're actually going to be able to communicate a message that they might otherwise never be open to. And that this is a time when we need to be using that message of limited government and why removing power from the state is so important. And from your article, it would appear as though you were suggesting the opposite. Do, have I read your article incorrectly? I want to see everybody converted to the cause. So it, no matter where somebody's coming from, the left or the right, I'm glad to have them. I guess what I'm saying is don't feel like even though what you're saying makes perfect sense and should resonate with people on the left. I mean, what, what could be more obvious right now than that we obviously have incompatible worldviews living side by side in this country and that maybe the best thing is not every four years to try to impose one on half and then the other on the other half every four years. 
Maybe we just go our separate ways and say, you know what, over here we're going to live this way, and if you want to live that crazy way over there, that's probably the best thing too. I mean, any sensible person at this point should be saying that. If they can get past all the superstition about one nation and this and that, then just think sensibly. Get, get all that crazy schoolhouse rock stuff you learned. Get that out of your head. Wash it out of your head. Just think common sense. Wouldn't this be the appropriate approach? The problem is it's true that the left on, in California, they're talking about secession, a small sliver of them. But ask yourself, why did it take them this long to reach that obvious conclusion? Answer, because they're on the losing side. And suddenly secession is on the table. But when other people were on the losing side and felt just as bad as these people do today, were their views taken respectfully into account? Were their views credited in any way? No, those people were dismissed as racists, as neo-Confederates. Those people aren't entitled to an opinion. But when we precious snowflakes feel like we ought to be able to secede, well, then we ought to be able to do it. So that goes to show there's no principle involved here. Well, and I, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Finish, okay, finish go ahead. Your well, I mean, so, so my, my point is most of these people, most people on the left, and, and I think a lot of people who have talked to their friends can tell you, their view is they're licking their wounds so they can fight another day because their attitude has always been. Now, there are exceptions. I know that. I wrote a book with a guy on the left. I know there are exceptions. But the left's whole reason of, for existing has been to impose social revolution on society from the top. It, their reason for existing has not been to surrender, has not been to say live and let live. Their reason for existing has been to impose a leftist blueprint on all of society. They're not going to give up half the country. That, that's not in their DNA. Their DNA tells them impose the leftist worldview on those people. Don't secede. Secession is for losers. Okay, no, that, that, that's fair. I, I understand what you're saying, but in my mind, what I, what I think you're, you're, at, you're identifying what is probably the, the 5% on the left that are – uh, I, I, I'm dogmatic in their belief about statism. And what I find when I talk to people is that the vast majority of them are illiterate when it comes, ignorant when it comes to really the policies and, and, and in, 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 intricities of a particular ideology. Most of them are acting, as, as uh, Friedman would say, out of uh, their own self-interest. And they think it is in their best interest to vote for these policies where people are going to give them stuff and that we're going to punish these people. And so they're, they're wandering through life seeking out their own, uh, their own personal ambitions, their own, uh, individual self-interest. And they're not, they're not dogmatic in what they believe. They're, they're not, uh, hardcore leftists. What they are are people who have been fed a specific ideology their entire life. And this may be the moment in time when light bulbs are starting to go off and they're starting to question some of the things that they have believed. And if, if we don't, if we don't try and approach the message, because the, the two questions I would have for you as follow-up is, how do I know, how do I differentiate between the guy who is, is just acting for his own self-interest and the guy who is a, a, a hardcore uh, socialist statist, and how do I know who I need to be spending my time communicating with? And then the second question that I would ask you is, if it is not appropriate to try and convert these folks and to try and spread the message to them, then how best do we continue to grow and expand uh, our, our influence in society, bringing on new members, if not through you know the the, the constant communication and what I would call uh, you know non-combative communication, where we're we're really trying to convert souls, so to speak, if you want to use the the a religious connotation. So, how would you respond to those two questions? All right. Well, after my presentation there, I wanted to add that. That doesn't mean we don't give it a shot, but we go into it with our eyes open and with, you know, Ron Paulish low expectations, right? He always said that he had low expectations. That's why he was never disappointed in Washington. I would say we have to go in with low expectations simply for the reasons that I mentioned. And I think also, I mean, let's, let's bear this in mind. Even though people say, look, libertarianism is not left or right, or there are some things the left might like about us and some things the right might like about us. The question is, how often does MSNBC have David Stockman on or Ron Paul or me or Peter Schiff or whatever? The question answers itself, whereas Fox News does have them on. For all its faults, 
and I have been – you find a lot of criticism of Fox News from me. They do have our people on. Even though on the left they could find anti-war, civil liberties, lots of great stuff, yet they don't. They don't have us on because I believe that it's my experience, my personal experience, is that they are intolerant as compared to the, the – uh, at least I can talk to some conservatives, not all. I can talk to some of them partly because I came from that so I can speak their language a bit. But I, they believe in private property. They believe in moral absolutes and in prudence and some of these basic values. And I can say, all right, well, your conservative movement is sending you down a road that's not compatible with your own stated views. And I've got an in with them. I don't feel like I have that in with the left. I could say to them, look, why don't we all just live and let live? And wouldn't that be better for you? At least you can have half a loaf. You might not get the whole loaf, but you can have half a loaf. That's a reasonable way to, to outreach to them. And if that draws people in, I'm all in favor of it. I just feel like when I have cast my net and made this, these different appeals to these different groups, the net comes back a lot fuller when I'm casting it on the right side of the spectrum than it does on the left. But I have plenty of listeners who, when I go on these rants, they write to me and say, Woods, I came from the left and I came right to you and, and it can work and it can be done. That's great. I just – I personally feel like that's not an area that I specialize in. I, I don't feel like I have a particular approach to the left that's going to work. But yeah, it should be said, and in memes and in videos, sure, let's hit it. At the very least, even if we don't persuade hardcore leftists, we might make that person on the fence who's not ideologically committed, maybe leans left just through force of habit – that you talked about maybe have second thoughts. And secondly, the ideologically uncommitted can look at these sorts of arguments that we're making and say, well, you know, that does seem reasonable. Like, why don't these people say, if we absolutely hate the regime we live under and we don't agree with any of its values, instead of just standing around stomping their feet, why don't they just go their own way? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. And, and I agree with you uh, to your point that it is it is much easier to talk about these ideas with people on the right than it is those on the left, and I think mainly because most of the people on the right that I ha that I come into contact with, and I I come from that side of it too, very neoconservative background is where I come from, and I, I find that most of them on the right say that they agree with the things that I, I say. You know, I talk about five principles: individualism. Uh, limited government, uh, free markets, peace tolerance, and, uh, and uh, what, what was that's it? That's the five. That's the five. Yeah, that's five of them. And I talk about these things, and, and when I'm talking to folks on the right, they say, or uh, conservatives, they say, oh, yeah, I believe in those things. And then you, but so now that you've got some common ground, now you can start pressing them on what that really means and, and what they have to be willing to do and accept if they're going to say that they, they adhere or they agree with those, those principles of liberty. You turn to the, to the left, and a lot of them don't agree with those things. They don't agree with the concept of individualism. They don't agree with the concept of, uh, of or they, they talk about in principle tolerance, but what they really mean is tolerant of people who believe like them. And so I, I do think that there is that there is some, it is a little bit easier to talk to those on the left. But uh, so if I can just clarify, you're not suggesting that we ignore 50% of the population that's extremely disappointed with the outcome of this election. What you're saying is um, choose your battles carefully and make sure that you're using your time effectively. Would that be a, a fair way of putting yeah, exactly, it? Yeah, do, I would suggest if you could be somebody who's just a jack of all trades who can reach all kinds of people. And if that's who you are, then be that person. I don't think I'm that person. Because if as soon as I start appealing to the left, then they're gonna start getting my emails where I'm viciously attacking the social justice warriors who I think are enemies of, of any society. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna stop doing that to kiss up to anybody. That's just not gonna happen. So I may not be the right person for that. But yeah, absolutely sure. I mean, of course I, I, I want as much outreach as possible. And we should, you know, it's funny. In April, I'm going to be speaking at Yale University at the Yale Political Union, which is a debating forum. Mm -hmm. And the presenter, it's it's a it's a zoo, the Yale Political Union, because the, the presenter makes his case for whatever the, the question is. And then people are just throwing out objections and shouting questions, and it's just crazy. And the topic I chose was the secession of American states and why it, it's a desirable thing and it's historically, constitutionally legitimate. And now I think I'm going to argue that somewhat differently in light of the Trump thing. 
And I am going to go right into the heart of leftism, and I am going to put this to them, and we're going to see how much progress I make. And now, so here, I want to be wrong, right? Because I don't want to lose at the Yale Political Union. I want to be wrong about what I'm telling you. I want those people to walk out of there saying, you know, that Woods sure made a good case for maybe hoping for the day that we can tell Birmingham, Alabama how to live again. Maybe that's not what we should be hoping for. Why don't we live in our own society that makes us happy mm -hmm. and where we don't have a Donald Trump who terrifies us? How about we just do that? You know, have finite goals, for heaven's sake, instead of always saving the world. How, do I, how about I think about my own family, my own neighborhood, things that actually have a tangible connection to myself? So we will see, and I will report back. That's I don't know the exact date, but it's tomwoods.com slash events is where all my events are listed sometime in April of 2017. So if you're, if you live in well, Connecticut, show up and cheer me on. Cause that's going to be a rough event. Go go and give Tom some support and, and, uh, and let me know when, when you're done, we'll have you back on to talk about it. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that. All right. Uh, so uh, in closing then, let me ask you, what did, what advice then would you give to someone? Cause I've been getting a lot of questions from my audience uh, saying, all right, what, what do I do now? How do, how do we make the most out of the next two years, four years uh, before and before the opportunity for a third party really becomes a, a mainstream. I, I'm not sure, Tom, how really interested in government you are. When I, when I listen to you and when I read your writings, I know that, that you have an interest in it because it affects your life, but I don't know in terms of political activism how much weight you give to that and, and, or, or whether you are one who just says, look, I'm, I'm here to preach a message to whoever will listen and I'm, I'm not particularly interested in, 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 in political activism. I'm, can you share a little bit with what, what you see as the best way to achieve the goal of, of broadening the message and expanding our ranks? Well, I mean, I, I guess on my show, a lot of times I'm not focused on current events, so it may seem like I have no interest in those things. It's, uh, it's partly that I, I want my episodes to be more evergreen, and if I'm just focused on one line of one piece of legislation, then that is very short-lived in terms of its shelf life. But I do follow what's going on, and I would personally, when I, when I watch how Donald Trump behaves and I find things that a lot of people find objectionable, I think it would be useful to call up how many times Obama did those things. Or for the never-Trumpers in the GOP, how many times George W. Bush did those things. I think it's very helpful for people to see how inconsistent everybody is. Oh, I'm just so horrified by Donald Trump. Oh, yeah? Well, were you horrified when Lincoln was, you know, of course you weren't alive then, but when you're reading your history book, when, when Lincoln was throwing uh, opponents of his policy in, in jail and when Woodrow Wilson was imprisoning people for speaking their minds or when FDR was actually setting up camps for people. and You go down the list on and on and on, things Obama's done, Bush has done, surveillance. You know, we get a little bit of a peep, maybe, here and there. So I would point out there's nothing new about Trump because if you that might be the, one of the ways to get through to people. If you really, really despise Trump and then you realize, well, but wait a minute, actually, come to think of it, there's not that much new about what he's doing. Maybe the problem goes beyond Trump. That would have to be the key issue we want to focus in on. It's getting people to understand that this goes way beyond Trump. And plus, half the things you're not going to like about Trump, the Democrats have been doing or winking at for years and years themselves. So at the very least, we can get people maybe broken out of that ideological prison that a lot of us have been trapped in for many years by this two-party system. Tom, I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks for sharing your thoughts and and uh, and and being a being a voice of reason in in a in a very unreasonable world. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Jason. All right, I got a few fun things to tell you about. Of course, Black Friday weekend is coming up. Black Friday is the best day of the year to get my libertyclassroom.com where you can learn the history and economics they kept from you. I'm going to run discounts all Black Friday weekend, but Black Friday itself will be the best day. So you'll want to check out libertyclassroom.com. Another great thing on Black Friday is if you've been meaning to start that blog, if you need to get web hosting, which you certainly do, then Bluehost is having the best price I have ever seen them have, which is $2.65 a month for web hosting as a Black Friday weekend special. Incredible. So if you want to get that and get all my neat bonuses, and man, do I have neat bonuses for this, 
Check out tomwoods.com slash publicity because you got to use my link to get your hosting. You get these really great bonuses, and you're going to get the best price you've ever seen. Now, speaking of that, I have a listener with a new site that I want to tell you about, and this one is called essenceofeconomics.com. It's a podcast and blog. He describes it as follows. My podcast, simply called Essence of Economics, teaches the classic texts of the free market. I just launched a few weeks ago, and I'm almost through teaching Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. I'll be following that up with other texts such as What Has Government Done to Our Money, The Law, Economic Depressions, Their Cause and Cure, and other books and articles. Each episode is around 30 minutes and covers a few chapters or one article. I began this podcast because I always want to read more, and I'm always trying to teach others about Austrian economics and libertarianism. So very, very good. Essenceofeconomics.com is the site. I will link to it at tomwoods.com slash 789. And of course, that's one of the bonuses you get if you use my link is I mention your show, or if you, I beg your pardon, I mention your blog, you may have a show, as this gentleman does, on my show. And it gets you a big old boatload of clicks. I'm telling you, you should see. I've seen graphs of where people's blogs are, and then I give them a shout-out, and it just goes right through the roof. Fantastic. So I appreciate that people are checking out what their fellow listeners are up to. And so do indeed check out EssenceOfEconomics.com. All right. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving. There have been years when I haven't done a Thanksgiving episode and years when I have, at least one year that I have. This is a yes to an episode on Thanksgiving year, and you are not going to believe how unbelievably tone-deaf and ridiculously inappropriate and absurd the topic is for Thanksgiving. Tune in and find out tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.